Welcome to Brain Health Matters, a series of courses, programs, and shows just like this, all designed to help you become healthier so your brain can become happier and stronger. This week, why is it that women have close to three times the incidence of Alzheimer's compared to men? The answers may surprise you. Be sure to stay tuned. Brain Health Matters is brought to you by Don't Let the Memories Fade. Learn many enjoyable ways to enhance body, mind, and spirit with simple lifestyle changes that will help you improve your memory and your mind. You can create a healthier, more vibrant future with Don't Let the Memories Fade. Available in ebook and paperback on Amazon everywhere. Hello and welcome to Brain Health Matters. I'm your host, Kate Kunkel, and this week, I'm joined by Dr. Felice Gersh, a multi-award winning physician with dual board certifications in OBGYN and integrative medicine. Dr. Gersh is the founder and director of the Integrative Medical Group of Irvine, a practice that provides comprehensive healthcare for women by combining the best evidence-based therapies from conventional, naturopathic, and holistic medicine. She's also a prolific writer and lecturer who speaks globally on women's health. She's the best-selling author of Menopause, 50 Things You Need to Know. Welcome, Dr. Gersh. Oh, my pleasure. I'm so happy to join you here. We know that more women than men develop dementia, but I'm hoping that you have some answers as to why, because it just doesn't seem to make sense. We usually take better care of ourselves. Well, there are some things that are out of our control. And one is the universal condition all women must face at a certain point around age 50, and that is the menopause. <clears throat> the word menopause is about, well, meno is the Greek word for moon and pause is for a stop. So it really focuses on the end of menstrual cycles. It's really a giant metabolic shift in women's health, and that includes brain health, because it turns out that the hormones that are always referred to as sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, are really about maintaining fertility, but that means maintaining the health of the whole body, because you can't have a fertile woman who's capable of reproducing in a body that is falling apart. <laughs> so these, I consider these hormones to be like the glue that glues all the processes and all the organs of the body together, along with the reproductive functions to allow ultimate success. And when we lose our reproductive capabilities, which of course is what menopause is really marking, you also lose the essential support system for all these other organ systems. Now, it turns out that the brain is one of the major organs that gets hit by the loss of these hormones. And that's what's not getting the emphasis it deserves. And so that's why I come out and I love being with you here to really educate on what the real significance is to brain health when you lose those ovarian hormones. So those three have to be in some kind of a balance, right? So is it when we go through menopause that they go out of balance or, that, or some of them just stop being produced? So testosterone is, of course, like every hormone, very important. Testosterone actually doesn't go down at the time of menopause. It does go down in terms of its ovarian production, but it goes down much more gradually and separate from the menopausal transition. When you get the menopausal transition and then ultimately you're in menopause, and we have to think of menopause as a process not like you cross a finish line. That's an arbitrary definition for menopause that you can only know in hindsight. And that's 12 consecutive months without a, a natural period. But we don't know when that is until after you look backwards, but that's an arbitrary defined moment. But really it's ovarian senescence, aging and decline of the ovaries. And that starts much earlier prior to the actual cessation of periods, like figure, it's, it's actually from the beginning, but, you know, and it kind of parallels the decline of fertility, like women are more fertile at 20 than they are at 40 and, and, and less so at 35, you know, so this is a gradual process. And for example, for testosterone by age 40, the typical woman has half her testosterone produced from her ovaries as she had at age 20. 
And it's nature's design because it really doesn't want a 40 year old to be having so many babies or to have such a big sex drive. So it all is based on reproduction and fertility. But, you know, once again, we humans kind of want to make our own rules. We don't care about what nature had in store for us, this whole aging process. You know, we're like, eh, I don't want to, because aging of the brain, especially, is horrific. I mean, we all like to look in the mirror and say, oh, look, I have perfect skin. I have no wrinkles. But, you know, and that's like an outward manifestation of things going on in the inside. But the last thing, and nobody wants wrinkles, but even worse than a wrinkle is like a shriveled up brain. So we definitely need to understand what's really happening in, in women as these ovarian hormones go down. So it's it, for estrogen and progesterone, it's not like they're going out of balance. That's sort of a process through the transition. But when they hit menopause, like there are none, like literally no estrogen, no progesterone at all is being produced by the ovaries. Now there's no backup system. <laughs> it's not like, oh, well, you know, some other organ with like a, like a generator that, that turns on when the electricity goes off. No, there's no like secret generator. So what happens is estrogen is produced locally on site in many organs. And in fact, that's how men have tons of estrogen in their bodies. They don't know that estrogen should be about one of their favorite hormones because they don't measure it. You can't measure it in the blood of men because it's made on site. And one of the biggest sites for producing estrogen and also can make progesterone is the brain. The brain has all the enzymes and tools to convert the precursors, which are androgens. For example, all estradiol, which is the type of estrogen made by ovaries, has to derive, come from testosterone. A hundred percent of estradiol comes from testosterone. And the ovary makes testosterone and it converts it into estrogen in the form of estradiol. And so does the brain. And that's how men make tons of estrogen in their brains. But they need to make it from all that testosterone. Well, women do make testosterone, but a tiny fraction of what men make. And remember, their levels are going down as they age as well. So by the time a woman is in menopause, you know, her testosterone is a fraction of what a man's testosterone is. So even though her brain has the tools to turn testosterone into estrogen, it doesn't have enough to make much. One of the things that very few people understand is all the different roles that estrogen plays throughout the body. And if you just look at the brain in particular, estrogen in the brain regulates the production of energy. Energy is essential to run everything, right? If you don't have energy, good luck. So energy is needed in huge amounts by the brain. Estrogen is key to running the mitochondria. Those are the energy producing structures that are in cells that create energy. Well, without estrogen, you can't produce adequate amounts of estrogen, of energy, and you have deficiencies of estrogen. So it's just one of those things, you're really stuck. And that's why almost universally women as they transition into menopause have word finding problems. Like they can't remember nouns and they, they think they're getting demented. Well, they are a little bit. They, they actually do have cognitive decline. And those night sweats and hot flashes, they're a sign of inflammation in the brain. It's like your brain's on fire. You know, that's not a good thing. You know, so the problem is that you have that energy production problem. <clears throat> now, on top of that, you have other problems. For example, the immune system of the brain is very complex and involves specialized immune cells called microglia and astrocytes. And for them to work properly, they need to have estrogen as sort of the regulator that turns the off and on switch, whether to turn them on and they become like attack animals or they stay in that sort of what we call surveillance, quiet mode, where they're just kind of like they're guards looking out for things, but they're, they're ready, but not taking action. When you don't have enough estrogen, it, you end up in this sort of inflammatory default state, pro-inflammatory. Those specialized immune cells get turned on and they start creating damage. They're designed to help dissolve like invading 
bacteria or dissolve damaged tissue so that the body can heal. But the problem is without proper regulation by estrogen being present, they go into this chronic state of on inflammation. So they put out their digestive type enzymes and they start dissolving good, healthy neurons. And, that's, and then the body starts trying to repair it. And that's where that the beta amyloid stuff, that stuff that's associated with Alzheimer's, that's why all those drugs that have been made to try to prevent beta amyloid or dissolve it, they never work. Why do they never work? Because the beta amyloid isn't the cause of Alzheimer's. It's a consequence of this pro-inflammatory state and the body's attempt to try to deal with it. And that pro-inflammatory state that creates that damage to the brain by these, our own cells, it's kind of like, you know, how we have autoimmune diseases where our own body attacks itself. It's not an autoimmune thing, but it's a similar thing in that our immune cells are actually damaging our own body tissues in the brain. And this is our body's attempt to try to deal with it. So getting rid of the beta amyloid isn't dealing with the problem. That's why those drugs have never worked. Yeah, the best they say they can get is slows the progressive, relentless. I mean, and that's really hard to measure. A lot of that stuff is very subjective. It's not, you know, measurable. And so, but it's not, it's not resolving. It's not reversing. It's doing none of the above. What about this idea of then replacing these hormones? Is that going to make it easier on our brain? Well, well, I mean, once you acknowledge, you know, this is, you know, you hit it right on the head. The first step is to define the problem. Like you, you can't define the problem incorrectly, like the problem with beta amyloid. That is not right. defining the problem. So if the defining the problem is we have this problem of energy deficiency and inflammation in the brain, and it's due to deficiencies of these hormones. Okay, that's now we've defined the problem. So what the heck are we going to do about it? Well, absolutely, for many women going on physiologic bioidentical, not from a horse, nothing like that, you know, human identical hormones can be beneficial. So that would be one thing that we can definitely do. And there are other things as well. So it's not just one thing because, and that's like, I would say very, very useful, but what maybe some women can't access hormones um, or they're, you know, they may have some contraindication. By the way, just as a side note, only oral estrogen, like in a birth control pill, a, a pill of estrogen, does that increase the risk of blood clots. When you take estrogen through the skin, what we call transdermal, it does not at all increase blood clotting. And the reality is that it's, it's just, if you understand estrogen, then you would see how farcical that whole notion is that estrogen causes cancer, estrogen causes blood clots. Estrogen modulates or regulates the entire immune system. Now, I mean, there are other things that come into play, but it's a very big key player. So the immune system, just like I mentioned in the brain, it has sort of an on and off state. It's like, it's either like quiet and like watching out for things like a guard, or it's an active participant and it starts the inflammatory process. And then it has to turn from pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory, which involves resolution and healing. And healing involves growing and nurturing growth factors. So platelets are part of all of that inflammation and resolution of inflammation process. So when you initiate inflammation, which estrogen will do under proper situations like an invading pathogen, like you're getting invaded by COVID or some other bacteria or something, right? So you have, <clears throat> so you have um, something coming into your body that doesn't belong there. So the immune system wants to attack it or you have injury like a burn or a big laceration. So trauma, trauma will also, damage tissue will also initiate the inflammation process. So estrogen, initiates that, which is essential and life-saving. <clears throat> Sorry. So it's, an, it's essential for life that we have a functional ability to create inflammation, but you have to resolve it. And, and with platelets, the initiation of inflammation involves blood clotting. 
so that like if you have trauma, you don't bleed to death. And also if you have an infection, the platelets will help create an encapsulation to wall off the infection. That's how you create an abscess cavity to wall off that infection from the rest of the body to help prevent the infection from circulating and going everywhere. Including the brain. But then right. everywhere. But then when you have inflammation resolution, the platelets are involved in the beautiful healing process, creating growth factors. And estrogen is about that. So it's only when you have oral estrogen, which actually only binds to specific receptors and doesn't give you the balanced effect of real estrogen that comes from the ovaries that you can give to women through their skin, that you get that imbalance where you go into more of an only pro-inflammatory and you can't do the resolution of anti-inflammatory. So that's why when you give estrogen, and we didn't understand this years ago, we didn't understand that estrogen is very complex. There's different forms, it works on different receptors. It has like on switch functions, off switch functions that you have to give what's human identical in order to get the optimal effect. And so I call it the effect of like the evil twin. So all of the negative effects that when you give oral estrogen, you know, that comes typically like from a horse or it can be synthesized, but it's not the same as what your ovaries make, but you call it as if it's the same as what your ovaries make. So it's like the evil twin. The evil twin is running around doing all the mischief and the good twin is getting all the blame. So we don't want to do that. So we want to make sure that we really understand that the way you give estrogen the format, you know, giving it through the skin and also proper dosing. So it mimics the levels that a healthy woman would have during her reproductive lifespan. That's how you end up getting the best effect. But so we shouldn't be afraid of hormones, but we should know that we, if anyone's going to use them, that you have to find a practitioner who actually understands them, you know, so that you get proper treatment. Um, oral contraceptives then, those are hormones that, you know, I see you shaking They're, your head, no. Yo, well, that's why they have all these warnings on birth control pills, that they can increase hypertension, high blood pressure, they can increase blood clots, and they're known to increase de um, depression, and even suicide risk in young adolescent girls. And if they're put on into young girls, we know that long term, they can increase their risk of heart attacks and strokes later in life. They, they don't allow proper bone and musculoskeletal development. So, and they don't affect, you know, the, the vagina and the bladder in proper ways. I mean, unfortunately, we do need good tools. I mean, we have to have good tools to prevent unwanted pregnancies, but we don't want to use birth control pills to simply like cover up bad periods. Yeah. So it's really important. Like the menstrual cycle is a vital sign of young reproductive age women. When the menstrual cycle is messed up, it means that she's messed up and we got to fix the problem. Once again, define the problem and fix the real problem. Don't just do smoke and mirrors and get rid of the woman's own natural hormones, natural rhythms and everything and give her this pseudo crap, you know, that's yeah. called birth control pills. Now there can be a time and a place for using them but they're overused and they're used in 13, 14 year olds. So a different thing, but those are not the same hormones. There's not a single hormone in a birth control pill that is ever naturally found in a human body. So it's really important to know is that the estrogens in birth control pills, of course, are not human estrogens. So they kept, you know, they had a lot of side effects because they're not even human estrogens. And so the goal became less is better. So they kept lowering and lowering the dose of the estrogens in the birth control pills. And it gave, it, it perpetuated this idea that less estrogen in the body is best. I mean, this whole notion that the less estrogen you have, the better off you are as a female. It's so bizarre. Nobody would say that to a 20 year old male. It's like, hey, I hope you have very little testosterone today. You know, nobody would think that. I mean, it's just so bizarre. Like estrogen is what makes a female a female. And of course we lose that with menopause and it is nature's intent, you know, and we just hate it. You know, most, most species on this planet, 
when they lose their reproductive abilities, they die. They literally die. They don't have life after reproduction ends. Humans and like elephants, there's very few of a species out there that actually can live beyond reproductive end. So, but, so then um, that that's the begs the question. Then if we if we are now living, I mean, obviously we're living, especially women seem to live much much past at least 20 maybe sometimes 30 or 40 years past reproductive age mm -hmm. so then we're putting ourselves naturally it seems then at risk of dementia or alzheimer's because we're kind of outliving that natural right. cycle right and in nature if you look at it the, the plan was like you live maybe a dozen years after reproduction ends and that's it and that allows time to help raise grandkids. And, and then it's like, you know, natural resources as they are, short, short supply, you know, goodbye. You know, we need to focus on the reproductive aged members of our tribe. So it, it, we have allowed women and men, women live a few years longer than men statistically, but live much worse off. Not only do women have two to three times the incidence of Alzheimer's disease, they also have more osteoporotic fractures. 80% are female who have those fractures. Women have more in the United States, more joint replacements than men from osteoarthritis. Women suffer from more pain, more depression, more anxiety by a, a factor of two to four times because remember mood and cognition are very, very interrelated issues. And uh, women really, uh, in like in the US, the biggest market for medical cannabis are menopausal women. They go into all the dispensaries because they're looking to get some help for all these symptoms that they're experiencing that no one is helping them with. So women live longer, but they don't live quality lives. And women make up so many of the nursing home, you know, residents. And, but when you match, remember age for age matching, it's not just because women live a little longer, they have more Alzheimer's. No, matched age to age, women dramatically surpass males on the incidence of, of both depression, anxiety, and dementia. And it's just by the time a woman hits 65, she has more high blood pressure, more strokes, more ruptured aneurysms than men, equal numbers of heart attacks. There's this little halo effect, like the first decade after menopause officially is you know, there, the first decade, I call it the halo effect, from all that estrogen that they had, assuming they you know, led healthy lives and had actual hormones in their bodies, the first decade, they kind of ride the wave of what they had before. And things are happening, but they're not, they're subclinical. They're, they're not really obvious. But once they hit into the 60s and by 65, all that halo is gone. You know, you can't, you can't live off of the past anymore. No, I'm sorry. So what do you do to protect yourself? Because I'm going to be 65 in a few months. Hmm, I'm getting a little concerned well, here. <laughs> Well, there's, there are some miracle foods that have actually been shown to be helpful, and they are phytoestrogen-containing foods. And many foods actually have, many foods that people don't even realize have estrogen binding capability. So they're not estrogen. I mean, so you're not eating estrogen, it may, but they're foods that have these magical ingredients called polyphenols that actually can work in the body to attach to receptors, which is how all hormones work by attaching to receptors, and they can actually mimic the effects of estrogen. It's, it's like amazing that nature allowed plants to help us in this way. So most people know that soy, which is a legume and it's a bean, so it's a soy bean, that soy has these, these magical polyphenols called the um, isoflavones. There are many, many different types of these polyphenols and isoflavones are known as phytoestrogens. But there are many other types of polyphenols that are also phytoestrogens, like resveratrol, which is found in like the skin of red grapes, and quercetin in like onions and garlic and apples. Um, and then there's the, um, the, the from flax seeds, and they, those are called lignans. And then there are the um, 
the urolithins that come from like pomegranates. And so, and all the legumes, many, many vegetables that people don't think of, all the phytoestrogens, so where do they come from? They come from plants. So they do not come from a steak. Now, I'm not saying no one can ever eat a steak, but you're not gonna get those magical polyphenols that act on estrogen receptors by eating a steak. But um, so the thing is by eating a great variety of fruits and vegetables, and that includes you know, the different legumes and also grains, people and nuts and seeds, nuts and seeds and, and whole grains can actually also act as phytoestrogens. So women, who eat a huge variety of plant-based foods will do, yay, yeah, because you're <laughs> vegan, right? So um, plant-based foods do much better, much better. And uh, so, but that's not really the typical diet no. of most women. It's very sad. And, and, and the processed foods, not only are they devoid in these incredible magical ingredients, but they also are poisons to our brains. Yes. And that's the other thing that's really important to know is that we have these important blood vessels that are, it's been called the blood brain barrier that helps to keep poisons that get into our circulation from you know, environmental pollutants and also our own body's waste products from getting into our precious brain. But the vascular system after menopause becomes malfunctional in, in, because it's, requires estrogen to make this magical gas called nitric oxide, which maintains the health of artery walls. So the so-called blood brain barrier becomes the, the leaky. So just like people get leaky gut, they get leaky brain. And these toxins that are circulating get into the brain. And so, you know, and so if you're eating more foods with toxins, you're just magnifying the problem. So, you know, you got to try to eat the best food possible and lots and lots of variety of different plants because you don't even know the magical ingredients in all those foods that you're eating and how they're going to help maintain the function of your brain and your mood. And they've shown this that women, for example, who have rheumatoid arthritis, which is related to all kinds of other inflammatory processes and so on, nothing is just about one thing. But when women who are have rheumatoid arthritis, which is the vast majority of them are menopausal women. And what happens is they have a lot of pain. In one month, they showed that if they go vegan and eat a ton of all these different types of fruits and vegetables and grains and nuts and seeds, that their pain goes down by 50% in just one month. I can attest and, and, to that because I was, oh. I was diagnosed with um, RA when I was 52. And that was well, right at menopause, right? And, yeah, that's and typical. I, I went, I, and it was the same time my mom was diagnosed with dementia, like the perfect storm of events. But it was my opportunity to really put my researcher's hat on and say, okay, what's going on here? Because I was healthy and now I'm feeling like crap and I am in pain all the time. My mom's sinking into this terrible hole. There's got to be something that we're both doing wrong. I went vegan. She by this time it was really late for her. She was pretty far gone, so we couldn't do a whole lot for her. But literally, I went vegan, and I haven't had any pain in my joints since. Oh my gosh! Well, I didn't, and we did not have this a discussion of this before we got no, together. No, we did so not. This, I, this, I, right? This wasn't like a, you know, like I was prepped for this. No, that, but that is absolutely the case. So that. You know, it's, it's so important to understand how what you eat can completely change how your brain works and how your immune system works because you were stuck in a totally pro-inflammatory state and every, like pain always is inflammation. So that means you're inflamed. And, that, and the other thing besides this wonderful diet, and I'm not vegan, but I'm like, I call vegan plus. I eat just a little teeny bit of, of animal, like, uh, it's like three ounces. That would be like a chicken drumstick equivalent, you know, a little, a little something, but not, not too much and not more than once a day and, um, and not every day. So, you know, I just call it vegan plus. And um, so the other thing that's magical for the brain in menopause is exercise. Exercise does so many things that help the brain. 
they've shown that, for example, and I mentioned that mood and cognition are very interrelated. When you exercise, it actually reduces depression or treats depression better than any antidepressant out there. It runs rings around them. It reduces inflammation. It reduces insulin resistance. And insulin resistance also becomes highly prevalent after menopause. Many women become pre-diabetic. They become high levels of insulin and glucose. They develop a lot of visceral fat that, oh, that, that hated belly fat that women get, even thin women. They're, when you actually look at their body composition, it's not healthy. They call them, and I didn't come up with this terminology, the skinny fats. You know, they have a bad body composition, not enough lean body mass, not enough muscle, and too much you know, fat hidden around their internal organs and their waistline, even though they're actually technically very thin. And um, very un it's, very, it's also actually very dangerous, that type of body composition. So women after menopause can be helped so much by exercise to improve their glucose regulation and their inflammatory status. Their gut microbiome is really helped so that they have less likelihood of leaky gut, which leads to a million and one you know, problems. And all women after menopause develop some degree of leaky gut because the gut microbiome transforms in an absence of estrogen as well. So there's so many wonderful benefits to, um, to exercise and exercise helps to improve the function of the mitochondria. You know, you take what you've got and you try to make it work the best it can. So, you know, this is like another sort of backdoor way that nature gave us. The other thing that can really be helpful is timed everything. Because one of the things that estrogen does in the body, it regulates our master clock. That's the master of the circadian rhythm. It's a group of neurons that sit on top of the optic nerve and senses the light and dark that comes in to regulate our time timing throughout the body. So after menopause, women actually live as if they're in jet lag all the time. It's like they're jumping across time zones all the time. And we know jet lag is definitely very unhealthy in every which way, but by timing everything, like eat at the same time every day, go to the bed at the same time, get bright light in the morning, get bright light at midday, get really dark at night, watch the sunset, you know, don't snack, just eat at set intervals, no more than three times a day and try to keep it, you know, very regulated. The more you eat to the beat, sleep to the beat, you know, keep dark and light, very separate and, and so forth, that will help to keep your body in the proper rhythm, the circadian rhythm and that will help all the organs to work properly, including the brain. The immune system is very rhythmic, very circadian. You have a very different functioning immune system in the middle of the night, in the first thing in the morning, late in the afternoon. And we've shown that, you know, you can get vaccines, you have a different effect if you get it in the morning or at night, you know, temperature and fevers and kids go up at night. There's reasons for this. Everything about the immune system is very rhythmic. So we need to recognize that the immune system does all the brain cleanup during the night. So if you're not sleeping, guess what you're not getting? Brain rehab. So that's really important. Now we understand the brain has its own lymphatic system. It's like cleanup system, but all of that requires proper sleep. And after menopause, a very large percentage of women have sleep problems. And that leads to mood problems and cognitive problems that the brain isn't getting the proper cleanup and the immune system is not doing able to do its proper job. So getting on a rhythm and helping the body to get into that, like don't stay up late. Don't say I'm a night owl because you're a human. You're diurnal, you're not nocturnal. You're not turning into an owl. So, you know, you just, if you do the same thing every day, you'll help. And then sometimes you do need some help. Like for example, some ashwagandha, you know, may help or L-theanine you know, maybe some Tulsi tea, you know, you have to do what you have to do to do some mild things to help you to sleep. And, and that can help progesterone naturally is very great for sleep. But you know, that's if you're on, on hormones. We're almost at the end of our time. So I, I want to thank you. Those nuggets that you just gave us. I mean, that's a whole, I'm sure that's in your book. Is that in your book? Cause your, your book sounds like it would be just like a prescription like that. Well, my, my menopause book is really right. 50 things you need to know. 
is really like a little encyclopedia. And it lists like a lot of like 50 different things at different stages of menopause and then um, things that you can do. But my upcoming book I'm gonna write is gonna be more of a, um, like a recipe for how to go through menopause instead of like, well, this is like, I have this symptom, I'm gonna look it up. I have this symptom, because if you really don't, un most people don't understand that so many things that women face are actually symptoms related to hormonal deficiencies and what you can do about it. And that's really like my little compendium book. But there's so many more books I have to write. <laughs> Just like you told me, you told me how many books you wrote. Well, I have a whole bunch more I have to write. And I'm so grateful for your knowledge and for sharing it with our listeners, Dr. Gersh. Um, how can people, can people work with you remotely or do they have to be in California or what's the scoop? Well, um, if you're in another country, I can, of course, talk with people anywhere on, on the planet in terms of like being able to prescribe. I, for that type of thing, I have to see patients once or twice in my office in California, um, except for people in California. We have crazy laws about licensing and doctors and so on, but I can do a lot with telemedicine. But if you're a, an American citizen in the United States and you're not a California resident, I have to see you once or twice in my office a year. But luckily I'm in beautiful resort town of Southern California in Irvine and next to Laguna Beach, Newport. But other than that, they can find your, your books um, and oh, your sure. website. I'll put, make sure to put your website in yeah. the show notes so that people can follow you and continue learning from you. Dr. Gersh, this has been wonderful. I cannot thank you enough for your time and your wisdom and your work. My pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Brain Health Matters. Be sure to subscribe with your favorite podcast service so that you can get all the latest episodes when they're released. 